Hello to my favorite Religion to Eleven students. This is Brother Smith. We are at BYU Upstairs, and uh, it is a beautiful day. This is part one of our lecture for, oh goodness, uh, Thursday, May, Thursday, May 21st. Got it? Thursday, May 21st. This is part one. Now, part two is going to be a little bit late. Uh, I have to go here in about an hour, and I'm going to drive about five hours to speak at a high school graduation, you guys. Now, get this. Now, because I told them I'd just Zoom it, right? I'm like, yeah, I can Zoom from my, you know, uh, from here. Uh, and they said that they're going to have a live graduation ceremony. This is down in Southern Nevada. Um, and uh, it's at a drive-in theater. So all the families drive in, um, and then they're going to have the actual speakers there and then broadcast them up on the screen, and they're going to listen on their car radios. So I'll let you know how that goes when part two comes around. All right. Uh, but for today, let's get started. Oh, by the way, um, I would like you to uh, read the rubric for the paper um, and be prepared uh, at your next Q&A to ask questions about it. So um, let me just give you some basics as you're reading through the rubric. The rubric makes it look um, much more uh, official than it is. Uh, you need to remember um, this is a devotional paper, not a research paper. So um, a devotional paper is like it's like you're writing this uh, this paper for the enzyme, okay? Um, yes, we want to have some good information in there, but at the same time, we want to, uh, we want, uh, sorry, I'm looking through my, I'm going to look for the syllabus here. At the same time, we, we you know, our, our object here is to build faith, right? And to kind of, um, uh, you know, announce our own faith, announce, write it down. Okay, so let me find the syllabus. Oh, goodness, you guys, I should have had this ready to go. I'm so sorry. Um, Religion 211, there you are. Uh, spring, there you are. Uh, okay, here's the syllabus. All right, now I'm looking at the syllabus and not at you, and you're looking at me, and I don't know what I look like, so this is weird. Okay, <clears throat> so on the last page of the syllabus, you'll see the Harmony of the Gospels paper. Um, and uh, we're going to analyze the four Gospels and kind of compare them, um, and then we're going to talk about uh, what do we learn in them, and that's more the devotional part. So if I were you, if I were writing this paper, one, I would read through the entire rubric just to make sure you have it down, and then two, I would, um, I would get thinking to myself, if I have a favorite part of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, what would they be? Right? Do I have a favorite parable or a favorite story or a favorite way that you know a gospel author chose to go this direction? Now, we haven't looked at John yet, so you'll have to be watching for that as we read. Uh, and the idea is to like give me an introduction, right, about the four gospels and how they work together. Then give me a page on Matthew, a page on Mark, a page on Luke, a page on John. Now, you might do less of one than more of the other, but don't forget one completely. Uh, and then give me a conclusion. And really what it is, it's like, I like Matthew because. I like Mark because. I like Luke because. I like John because. And they're all needed, right? That's why we're talking about harmony of the Gospels. Because one thing we don't want to walk out of this class is, oh, they're all the same, right? It's just four stories, um, four for the exact same story, because they're not. They all bring different, they have different audiences, right? And you want to mention that in the paper. They all have different audiences. They all have different uh, purposes. Uh, you know, why, why are they writing? And how can you see their intent and audience in their writing? That kind of thing. So again, bring some questions to, uh, to the Q&A, and we will make sure you are all set. The best way to write this paper is a little bit every day, starting now. Um, uh, it's it's much easier than trying to write it with two days to go. So if you'll just sit down and say, okay, for now, just say, okay, if I had to choose a favorite story from each of the four Gospels, what would I choose? And let's go that far, and then let's talk in the Q&A. All right, uh, let's share our screen here, and let's talk exam two, because I'm going to ask you some questions from our last lecture. 
and I think we started in Luke chapter 9. I'm really hoping we did. I think we did. Uh, and we talked about the Samaritan and Jewish antagonism. Um, and I would ask you just to know the basic history of the Samaritans. Do you know the basic history of the Samaritans? Right? Where did they come from? Um, and why were they there? Why, why, why was Samaria in between Galilee and Judea? Right? Um, and what did they believe? Uh, and what's their, just their basic history? Uh, if you don't know those things, ask them on a Q&A so we can explain them again. Uh, and you remember Jesus is going through Samaria. He's not one of those Jews that goes around Samaria. He goes through it. And James and John are super offended when a city wouldn't let him stay there because he's a Jew. And uh, Jesus, they wanted to nuke it, right? They're like, Lord, should we command fire to come down from heaven? And the Lord's like, no, let's not. Uh, he says, you, not know, you know not what manner spirit you are of. Right. We talked about them. They went to another village. I really like that statement, that idea of like, just relax, right? Let it go. Um, it's okay. Uh, yeah. Someone did something very offensive. It's okay. Um, don't, don't, don't fall into that trap of getting offended at, you know, every possible moment. Um, you're going to, that's an unhappy life. All right. Uh, now there are some things that are offensive, by the way. I'm not saying that people aren't offensive. Yeah, go to sacrament meeting for six months. You will find something offensive that is said. But, you, but when it's offensive, I want you to think of that statement, right? They went to another village. Like, now don't go to a new ward or a new church, but they just, you know, they let it. Jesus wanted to be like, it's fine. They, they offended us. They said something terrible. Let's move on. Let's go somewhere else. No need to uh, have revenge. No need to, all right. Okay. Um, then we talked about Luke chapter 10, the Good Samaritan. I'll probably ask you on exam, who's the only gospel author to tell us the parable of the Good Samaritan? Um, I like questions like that. They're easy. Uh, and we talked about how um, each specific piece of the parable can teach us something, right? Jerusalem to Jericho is a, is a long fall, right? It's from the mountains up high to, the, um, to down by the Dead Sea right? Highest place in the Holy Land, lowest place in the Holy Land. Uh, the thieves, we said, um, represented Satan in that other take on it, right? They took his clothes, uh, they wounded him, left him half dead. If you want that entire outline, I've just added it there. There it is right there. So if you want that entire outline, you can have it uh, between, you know, um, the first the first part of the parable we have to get is the idea of who's my neighbor, right? And then the second is the fallen redemption of, of man. You want to make sure you get both. You don't want to just go straight to that second one. And remember, that second one is an interpretation. Do I think Jesus intended it? Man, I mean, it fits really, really well. But um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, so we need to know this one. Um, I probably won't ask you the. Um, the, the symbols of it. I'll probably just ask you, you know, which parable did we say has kind of a double meaning? Uh, one about um, serving others, the second about the fallen redemption of mankind, something like that. All right, then we talked about Mary and Martha, if you remember, um, and how uh, Martha was very upset that Mary wasn't helping her, and we just made a couple of insights there, right? Not to criticize the other the way people honor Jesus, uh, maybe to think through what Martha, Martha's mindset is, right? This idea of, does she have more to offer Jesus or does Jesus have more to offer her, right? What should she be doing? Um, that's the idea of good, better, best. Uh, so I don't know what I'll ask you about on that. Um, we didn't spend a lot of time on it. So uh, if I do ask you something, it'll be just one of those bullet points. Okay, um, then we talked about the parable of the rich fool, right? And how the Savior said, beware, be careful with money, right? Remember the parable of the sower, the deceitfulness of riches, right? This seems to be something he, <clears throat> he hits all the time. And it's not necessarily that money's evil. It's the idea that it's very tempting. It can creep up on you and become kind of all you, right? It can become your first priority. Beware of covetousness. A man or a woman's life is not it's not the total of the things which they possess, right? Um, 
I've noticed the stuff I buy usually just gets thrown away. I'm, I'm too quick to buy something on Amazon, right? I'm like, I need something like this. Do they have something like this? I look it up on Amazon. Oh, they do have it. Somebody, I would buy it, right? And then six months later, I'm like, I don't need this. Why did I buy this? So um, this rich fool is a lot like me, although I'm not rich. I guess I'm just the fool. Um, <clears throat> but he just hoards and hoards and hoards, thinking one day he's going to be able to use all these things, right? But then he dies. He says to his soul, soul, let's retire. And then, yeah, it really retires. His actual body retires. Uh, and this idea of, I th always thought I'd have more time to work my life out, right? I always thought future me is going to be different. You guys ever do that? Do you ever say future me is going to be different? Future me is going to eat better. Future me is going to not date, you know, jerks. Future me is going to be so much better. Uh, future me is going to exercise. Future me, right? I'm going to be so different. But right now, I can't do that. But future me, man, she is awesome. He is awesome. Um, I would beware of that, that idea because future me is always future me, right? Future me should be here by now. Um, we've been talking about him for years. Where is he? Uh, and it's because he's always out there, right? If you, if we can't have this idea of, oh, I'll always have more time uh, to make the changes I know I should. No, today's the day. Today's the day. Make the changes. All right. Um, and then the next review slide. Oh, we did that one. Okay. This next review slide is the idea of, oh, look, I did the uh, Luke 12 twice. I really want you to beware of covetousness, you guys. <laughs> okay. Uh, Luke 13, um, the woman uh, and the man, um, both, she's bowed together, remember, and he has uh, edema, I think it is. Um, and just the idea is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day. And we talked about the Sabbath day and how the Savior treated the Sabbath day. Uh, I, if I ask you something about that, it'll be very basic. I'll just right off the review slide. Uh, 14, the parable of the Great Supper was just really about Jews and Gentiles, about how he invited the Jews to the dinner and they all made excuses on why they couldn't make it. And so he invited others, right? That would be the Gentiles. So that's the exegetical look at that parable. But there's also an eisegetical look at that parable, which is, you know, when the Lord gives us all these blessings and we have all these excuses on why we can't, you know, why we can't take part in these blessings. Come to general conference. Oh, I would, you know, I would, but I can't. Uh, go to the temple. Oh, I would, but, you know, I'm very busy. Uh, I think uh, there's something in this parable about, fine, I'll give it to somebody else who will appreciate it. Okay, and then we finished in Luke 15. Uh, the details are so important. Uh, that's another thing I might ask you about the Good Samaritan. I might ask you just some, um, uh, back in Luke 10, I might ask you on an exam, like, about, you know, just the little details that are important. Like, if I asked you on an exam, um, this statement is from the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? And the statement is, uh, and they departed, the thieves, they departed leaving him, um, leaving him for dead, right? And you're like, no, they left him half dead. And that was an important part to understanding the, the second meaning to the parable, right? Uh, or um, this man, uh, I don't know, like if this Samaritan said he set him on his own feet, right? And walked by him. And then we said, no, no, he set him on his own beast, right? Meaning he carried him. He used his, you know, he carried him. And we, we tied that to Jesus in Isaiah 53. So um, although I probably won't ask you the specifics about what e we said each one meant, I might ask you for like, hey, what are the details of the parable? And I would want you to know those. Uh, same with uh, the prodigal son. We'll get to that. We talked about the sheep being lost through irresponsibility and kind of the sheep's kind of dumb. Uh, we talked about the coin being lost through neglect, right? And our job is to go find those people, right? To go and, and make contact with them. Um, some of you are on campus, I know. Uh, how are you doing on keeping track of your siblings, right? I can't remember if we talked about this or those of you who serve missions, how are you doing helping your um the people you baptized, the people you brought into the church, right? How are you doing on making sure that you're, you know, just checking up on them? I, you're not in charge of them. I get that. They have a ward. Uh, but still, I mean, this is part of our, part of, you know, of Luke 15. Don't lose people. Don't neglect them. Don't, don't just, you know, what happened to that one sheep, right? By the way, um, I like both the lost sheep and the lost coin because you can only, you, you can only, um, 
know if you've lost something if you're counting them, right? So like, I don't think the shepherd looks at the entire flock of sheep and goes, where's Bobby, right? I think he's counting them. Uh, the same with the coin, right? You don't look at a stack of quarters and go, wait, that's four bucks. It should be 425, right? I, you've got to count them. So this idea of we, we've got to count people, I think is an important part from Luke 15. Is we, you know, oftentimes in church, we set up chairs for those who attend, but we don't set up chairs for those who don't attend. Um, and when we see those full chairs, we're like, everyone's here, but you're not counting, right? Um, if you're a Relief Society president, uh, presidency, or if you're an Elders Corps presidency, set up a chair for every person on the roll, then see how it looks when, you know, the usual people attend. You'll, you'll notice empty chairs. This is the idea of counting them, right? Okay, and then we got to the prodigal son. I'll probably ask you about the details. So make sure you can tell this parable to somebody else. Same with the uh, Good Samaritan. Make sure you can tell those, these parables to somebody else and, and get all these details. Um, uh, like he gathered all together, right? If I were to say when the Good Samaritan, or sorry, when the uh, prodigal son left, um, he gathered most of his stuff, right? Or if I were to ask you, uh, let's see, when he came near to the house, his father saw him. That changes the parable, right? Um, uh, the idea of uh, no man gave unto him, the prodigal. We talked about him having no friends, right? And yet here's the second son who says, you've never thrown me a party with my friends, right? That's an, in, that's an important detail in there. If we miss it, uh, then, then we're, we're, we're missing, you know, more and more principles by if we miss details. So um, as soon as this thy son was come, right, which is devoured thy living with harlots, and the father responds, no, this thy brother was dead. So these, um, these little details make a difference. So um, I am going to ask you about them. I know you're like, Brother Smith, I know, but I'm not going to ask you details on every parable, just the ones I tell you about. So that's, you know, that's nice. Okay, so there's your two review slides. Make sure you know them. Uh, make sure you know, uh, you know, each bullet point and just the basics of the story. Again, the best way to, to study a review slide is to teach it to somebody else. I haven't looked at your exam scores yet, um, uh, but hopefully they're great. All right. Let's go to Luke 16. You got your scriptures open? Let's go to Luke 16 and let's talk about the most confusing parable um, uh, that Jesus told. And this one is still confusing. It confuses New Testament scholars today. Uh, it, um, it's, it's, it's a tough one. A lot of people just don't get this one. Okay, it's called the parable of the unjust steward. Let me just give you a couple of takes on it and that, that you might help you um, go, oh, okay, that, you know, that makes a little bit of sense. So the Savior tells a story <clears throat> about a man uh, who contacts his, uh, one of his managers. All right, so he's like the owner, and um, he, you know, let's say he owns like nine franchises of McDonald's, all right? Oh, my, can I come up with something better? He owns nine um, Chick-fil-A. He owns nine Chick-fil-A stores, and he hears word that one of his managers of one of his stores has been embezzling money. So he sends word to him, and he said, um, how is it that I hear this of thee, verse 2, give an account of thy stewardship, for you may no longer be steward. So he's just heard that the guy has been dishonest, and he's like, I want the numbers. Send me the numbers. All right, so the steward, the manager, says, uh oh, what shall I do? My Lord is going to take away my stewardship. Um, he's going to take away my job. I cannot dig, meaning he's not, he's not, he doesn't want to do manual labor. Uh, and to beg, I am ashamed, meaning I'm not going to, I'm not going to become homeless and beg, and I'm not going to do manual labor. He said, I know what I need to do. Uh, if I am, when I am put out of my stewardship, meaning when I lose my job, that they, others, may receive me into their houses or into their businesses. So he makes a plan. He's like, okay, I've got to, I've got to start looking for a new job because I might lose my job here. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him. So uh, let's say at our Chick-fil-A store, uh, the guy who supplies the chicken, um, he owes the store a little bit of money. And so uh, the manager calls him up and he says, how much do you owe our store? How much do you owe my Lord, right? Meaning our store. And the guy says, oh, I owe you a hundred. Uh, I owed you a uh, hundred 
a hundred bucks, whatever, a hundred thousand dollars. I don't care. And the guy says, all right, we'll, if you write out 50, if you'll send me a check for $50,000, 50 bucks, whatever, half, um, we'll call it even. And of course you're going to take that deal, right? If your landlord called you guys and said, Hey, um, if you can give me the check today, I will, I will do 50% of your rent, right? You're like, uh, yeah. How many months could I give you? Right. Could I go six months of this? Cause you're, of course you're going to take a 50% discount. Um, and then he calls someone else. Uh, and he says, how much do you owe my Lord? And the guy says, I owe him 80. Uh, oh, sorry. I owe him a hundred, uh, measures of wheat. So one's oil, one's wheat. And the guy says, okay, right for score. So I'm going to give you 20% off 80. Uh, and okay. So this guy, why is he doing this? Um, he's not trying to hurt his manager as, or his owner as much as he is trying to gain favor in these two guys eyes. So he's like, okay, if I, if I cut your bill in half, then um, it's like you owe me one, right? So if I lose my job, I can go to those two businesses and I can say, Hey, at least can go to one or the other and say, Hey, remember how I, remember how I did that for you? Um, will you do this for me? All right. Now, most people um, would expect the, the Lord in the story, not the Lord Jesus, but the Lord in the story, the owner, to be super upset, right? But this is the confusing part. It says in verse eight, the Lord commended the unjust steward, right? This is where it gets confusing. People are like, what? He's like, good job, good thinking, because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Um, and that, that phrase just means um, the children of this world are those who are super secular uh, and they're, they're, they, they're smart, right? And they're careful and they're strategic in business. And he's like, why can't I get my followers, the children of light, to be more careful and strategic, right? Uh, and then verse nine kind of blows the whole thing out of the water because you're like, what in the world? He says, I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Um, if you look at it and just try to take that at straight value, it basically says, make friends with bad people. So if you go to hell, you'll have friends there. And that's, you're like, what? All right. So that's the parable of the unjust steward. Now, let me give you some takes on it that you could go, oh, okay, that helps a little bit. One, you need to understand that they never said this guy actually embezzled the money. He was just accused of embezzling money and he's nervous about losing his job, right? Even if, even if you weren't guilty, you'd still be nervous. You were going to lose your job, right? So, um, so he goes out and the discounts aren't ripping off his owner. Uh, some people think the discounts he gave would have been his commission. So if the guy owed, who owed 100 measures of oil actually would have paid 100 measures of oil, the owner would have gotten 50 and the manager would have gotten 50. That's why they're different amounts. When the other guy owes 100 measures of wheat, um, he says, right, 80, because um, there's people who think, oh, that's his discount, right? So he's, instead of taking the money for himself, he's basically saying, I'll take my commission off. Uh, and so I can, we can get the owner his money, but my money, I'm going to let you keep it. So it's the idea of like, look at what I did, did for you. I'm paying you a favor. Other people think that he's trying to get his business into the black. Um, I don't know if you know what that means. Um, if your business is in the red, that means that you're losing money, right? You're, you have more expenses than you have revenue. And if your business is in the black, you have more revenue or sales than you do expenses. And by by uh, cutting off his commission, he was able to get his company into the black. Does that make sense? Um, now, the last part, uh, verse uh, eight, um, it, or sorry, verse nine, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. There's other translations of that. Use Bible Hub. And if you were to look up Luke 16, nine, really, the other translations kind of make it more clearer. It says to like, it says to use your money to be a good person because when you die, your money won't go with you, but your friends will. Does that make sense? So you've got all this money, use it to, to um, help people and bless people. 
um, because those those feelings of those people who you know will go will carry with you into the into the next life those people are still going to love you whereas your money if you didn't spend it on people then you wouldn't uh you know the money's still on earth it didn't do do you much does that make sense if i was if i was super confusing on that will you just let me know on the q a be like brother smith you just made it worse okay let's keep going uh best parable that jesus ever told is called the parable of lazarus and the rich man um is that the doctrine of the church that this is the best parable jesus told yes it is uh the doctrine of the church of brother smith uh because this is oh i love this parable you guys and no one ever talks about it It makes me so sad this one should be just as big as the prodigal son sorry i'm like picking at my hand here i'm so excited okay Luke 16 starts in verse 19. The Savior said there once, once upon a time, there was a rich man which was clothed in purple. Now, uh, the reason he brings up purple is because poop, 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 that's really nice of me to say. Um, purple is super expensive. It, um, you get it from snails. So like purple dye, you had to crush snails up. And, you know, you wouldn't get very much. You get like a tiny drop out of one snail. So you got to crush, you know, you know, hundreds, thousands of snails uh, to get purple. Um, so it takes a lot of money. So he's just kind of telling us how rich this guy is. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple. He's like royalty, right? Fine linen, meaning he's got Lululemon. He's got nice clothes, right? I don't know. That's the only one I can think of. Um, and he fared sumptuously every day. So he's got more than enough to eat every single day day. All right. Now you and I would kind of fit in that category, wouldn't we? In verse 19, um, we have good, nice clothes and we're doing well every day. Right. Okay. And on the other end of the spectrum, there's a certain beggar named Lazarus. Now here's what's fascinating you guys. This guy, Lazarus in verse 20 is the only person who's ever named in one of Jesus's parables, right? It's always the rich man, the Samaritan, the Levite, the priest. This is the only person who has a name. So um, we have to think, why did the Lord do that? Why did he give him a name? He said, which was laid at his gate full of sores. So laid at his gate means like at his front door um, or at the gate of his estate. So if you can picture an estate, right? And you pull up in your, uh, your Rolls Royce and the gates open, that's where Lazarus sits right there. Um, and he was laid there, meaning apparently he can't move, right? People actually brought him there and just set him down there. And he was full of sores. So he's got all sorts of grossness happening to his body. Uh, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. So he just wants, he's, he's asking the guy, he's like, can I get some of the crumbs that fall off your table? The leftovers maybe. So I know. Um, I know some of you are like, Lazarus ought to get himself a job. Yeah, I know, I know. But remember, he can't move and he doesn't want the guy's food, right? He doesn't want the food the guy's going to eat. He wants the food he's going to throw away. Um, and it says, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Uh, there's some confusion on why that's in there. Uh, some New Testament scholars think it's the idea of people. That's how people see him as like a, in, a, in the pack of stray dogs, right? Um, and others uh, think um, that the idea is that he doesn't have the strength to push the dogs away. Like that's how much he cannot move. He doesn't, like a dog will come up and lick him and he doesn't have the mobility or the strength to get the dogs away. Okay. All right. So, um, and it came to pass. Oh, by the way, um, this is fascinating to me uh, that <clears throat> if, if there were a rich man and a homeless man, which one would you more, which one would it be more likely that you knew the name of, right? Maybe that's why the Savior named him is because if we saw a really rich man, you could probably name some. You'd be like Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Donald Trump, uh, right? Uh, Michael Jordan, uh, LeBron James. There are some, a lot of rich men that we know, rich women too right? Oprah, right? We know a lot of rich people. We know them. If we saw their face, we'd know their name, right? But Jesus just calls this guy a rich man, but he knows the name of the beggar. And I, I gotta be honest, I don't know if I know any names of any homeless people. Now, I don't see them very often, um, 
maybe on your mission, you knew some names of some homeless people, but uh, it's fascinating that it's kind of reversed, right? Where we would know the name of the rich man, we wouldn't know the name of the beggar. Jesus knows the name of the beggar and the rich man, he's like, that's just some rich man. Okay. Uh, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. You ever heard that phrase, Abraham's bosom? Um, it's like, uh, there's, it's in gospel songs, like, carry my soul in the bosom of Abraham, carry my soul in the bosom of Abraham, carry my soul in the bosom of Abraham, oh, carry my soul. You ever heard that? Okay, sorry, that was really long. Okay, uh, and what this means is, is that Abraham, um, okay, so Abraham's bosom is his chest, right? So this idea is that you're sitting, oh, see if I can find the picture, um, that you are sitting um, at dinner with someone. And when they ate back in Jesus's day, you actually lay down to eat. So let me see if I can find a picture from like Last Supper or something. So, uh, because I've, I've, I've got this general idea and it really helps to see it. If we were in class, I would be able to kind of just show you um, by lining some people up, but uh, I can't do that. So uh, this is my Christ in Everlasting Gospel lessons, by the way, that you're seeing. Okay, here's Last Supper. All right, so let's look at the Last Supper. Come on up, Last Supper, PowerPoint is opening, Last Supper, good, good, good. Okay, now, do you see how they're sitting? All right, so can you guys see that? You guys can see that, right? Okay, can you see how they're sitting? So you're sitting on your um, left hip and you eat with your right hand, okay? So when you're sitting in someone's bosom, that just means you're sitting next to them. And if you wanted to talk to them, like look on, on this side of the picture, uh, the guy in gold, all right? Oh no, let's do the guy in green since there's only one in green. So look at the guy in green. If he wants to talk to the guy in gold behind him, what's he gonna do, right? He can't flip around, but he's on his left hip. So he can't flip around and go, well, hey, right? He's gonna have to lay back. Do you see the guy in green on, this, on our side of the table? He's gonna have to lay back. And in order to talk to him, they're actually gonna be really close together because he's actually gonna lay on his chest, right, to talk to him. Does that make sense? Now, for you and I, that would be weird, but for them, it's not. It's co their culture, right? And there's nothing wrong with, um, we're not ethnocentric. We're not like, oh, you know, their culture is bad. Mine is good. No, this is their culture. And they would have no problem talking. So, so when it says he's carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, what that means is that uh, Lazarus is eating with Abraham and he's talking to him. He's sitting right next to him. All right, that would be like uh, you saw, like Brother Smith died and someone saw him at lunch with Joseph Smith, right? Like we're just sitting at a table talking over lunch, right? What Jesus is doing is trying to make him, take him to the highest possible dreamlike, awesome, heavenly place that a Jew could think of, right? That he is at dinner with Abraham, which makes sense because what did he want on earth? He just wanted crumbs and now he's got, food, and he's also got friends, like prophets, friends. Okay, uh, and the rich man died, Jesus says, and was buried, right? He doesn't even say, he's like, he died. Um, and in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and he sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So now, do you see how great this parable is? Look at the irony of this. Their, their roles have been reversed, right? Remember, Lazarus just was staring at the guy's food saying, can I have a, a crumb of your food, right? And now this guy's in hell and he can see Lazarus eating with Abraham. And he says, he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. Ooh, we find out he knew his name right? This wasn't something that you're like, well, how could, you know, what if he just never saw Lazarus? No, he knows his name. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Ooh, poor guy, right? He's like, can I, can you, how thirsty would you have to be, you guys, to be like, could you touch that water and touch my tongue, right? Um, now, the whole point is not, can you give me drops? Um, because if he's, if he's smart, he'd be like, send Lazarus a gallon of water, right? Not a drop of water. But do you see the roles are reversed? What did Lazarus want on earth? He wanted just crumbs. What does the guy want in hell? He just wants drops. Do you see how uh, the, the, the position is reversed? 
Uh, by the way, do you see how he sees Lazarus still in hell? How does he see Lazarus? Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. How does he see Lazarus? He sees him as a servant. He still sees him as lower than him, right? Um, Abraham, that's Lazarus. You probably know he's a, you know, a really low on the social system. So send him over here as my slave, right? But Abraham said, son, now this is an important point because remember um, John the Baptist said to the Pharisees, you're going to say you're the children of Abraham and you're going to be saved because you're the children of Abraham, right? And Abraham's like, son, he knows he's one of his children. He's still over there in hell. Remember that thou in thy lifetime received good things and how Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. So Abraham's just kind of like rubbing it in. He's like, man, your situations have been totally swapped. That's crazy. Um, and he said, but I can't help you. Beside all this, between you and I, there is a great gulf fixed where I can't get to you. And uh, even if I wanted to, we can't pass, right? Now, for Latter-day Saints, this is, this is a beautiful verse because it fits with our doctrine perfectly. We believe that before the Savior's atonement and resurrection, there was no connection between spirit, what we would say is spirit paradise and spirit prison, right? That they were separated. And that after the Savior's atonement, according to section 138 of the Doctrine and Covenants, he established a missionary force to go from spirit paradise into spirit prison. So, uh, but when is Jesus telling this story? He's telling it before his atonement and resurrection. So uh, there is the gulf between the two. And he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. So the guy still sees Lazarus. He's like, send him to my father's house. Uh, I have five brethren. He has five brothers. And he said he needs to testify to them. So he wants Lazarus to go back to earth as like, you know, Jacob Marley and go back and say, uh, you know, you got, you're going to end up in hell like your brother if you don't change. And then Abraham says to the guy, well, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Moses and the prophets is scriptures. They have the scriptures. Let them read them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, if one went unto them from the dead, they would repent. So scriptures aren't good enough, right? If one went from, unto them from the dead, they would change. And uh, Abraham's statement is great. He says, no, if they don't hear Moses nor the prophets, meaning if they don't read scripture, they would not be persuaded even if one rose from the dead. Now, isn't this great? Like, even if one, who? Who does he want to go back? Lazarus, even if one rose from the dead, right? Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. So, I mean, what if the actual Lazarus, not the one in this story, he's fictional, but the, the, the real Lazarus, the one in John 11 that Jesus raises from the dead, what if he was there and Jesus was like, once upon a time, there was a rich man and a poor beggar named Lazarus, right? And Lazarus is like, hey, I got to be in the story. Why can't I be the rich man? Right. And um, then Jesus is telling this whole story. And at the very end, he gets over and he said, and Abraham said, nah, if they don't read scripture, they wouldn't be persuaded, even if Lazarus came back from the dead. Now, he could be referring to Lazarus. He also could be referring to himself, right? Because he's going to come back from the dead, uh, rose from the dead. So, um, okay, what's the whole point? If I, we were to stop right here and say, okay, what's the whole point of this parable? Um, let me ask you a couple of questions. Um, oh, this is good stuff. What would you have in heaven if you died today and the only things you got in heaven were um, the things you gave away here? Because it, it sounds like this rich guy gave away nothing, so he had nothing. What would you have? You'd have 10% of your income. You'd have a lot of pencils, a lot of gum, old clothes, a lot of cookies, right? Would your life be different if you knew that the only things you got in heaven were the things you gave away here, right? Um, others uh, would be um, the idea of other principles would be of watching out for those around us, right? Now, I'm not saying, please do not get me wrong, I am not saying you need to give money to the homeless on the street. That's not what I'm saying. All right. I think there's laws against um, panhandling. So that's not what this is about. It's not about panhandling. Um, this is about, um, this is about caring for souls, right? Not seeing anyone is less than you. Um, this is about uh, the idea of in the next life, right? Uh, that 
there's there's a sense of there's a there's a sense of justice, right? Um, and there's just all sorts of good stuff in the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Will you comment below what you think this parable is about? Comment. Just uh, grab, you know, right now, just jump on the, you're, you're already on YouTube, so just comment. Here's what I think the parable of Lazarus and the rich man is really about. You don't have to, but I really want you to. I want to hear from you. Remember, one comment on every video from everybody, okay? Uh, and it won't take you that long. And you're like, Brother Smith, I don't want to. Yeah, it's selfish of me. I want to hear what you think. That's the one thing that's really missing from our classroom experience is I don't get to hear what you think. Um, you know, we're doing a little Q&A, which I really enjoy, but I want to hear your insights. I want to hear something that I didn't know before uh, that, that I'm like, whoa, you know, because some of the things I'm teaching you by guys, by the way, are things that I've gleaned off of students in the last um, 10 years. Right. Sometimes a student will say something like, I've never thought of that. And I'll add it and then I'll end it, add it to my lesson. So I want to hear from you. Okay. Uh, we're taking a long time here. We've, we've got to go faster. Uh, Luke chapter 17. Um, Luke 17. I'm just checking the time. Uh, is the, is, it's not a parable. It's the story. Some people call this the parable of the 10 lepers. It's not a parable. It's a story. So there's 10 lepers. And you, you, we've already talked about lepers and how they would have to live together. So it makes sense that they'd be together. And in Luke 17, he's passing through uh, Samaria, right? That's verse 11. As he was going to Jerusalem, he passed through the midst of Samaria. And 10 men, 10 lepers start yelling to him, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. Um, meaning heal us, right? They've heard. And he said, go show yourselves to the priests, which is fascinating because you don't go show yourself to the priest until, until after you're, you're healed. So leprosy could go away in Jesus's day. You could actually, you know, it could be healed at, for some. Um, and if you went and showed yourself to the priest and he saw that you didn't have any leprosy, you were allowed back into society. So this is what they should do if they were clean, clean, right? And he's like, go show yourselves to the priest. I wonder if some of them are like, no, we didn't need directions. We actually need to be healed, right? I don't think you understand. Uh, but look what it says. As it came to pass, as they went, they were cleansed. Do you see a principle there? This idea of be obedient to what I told you to do, um, even though it doesn't make sense. And um, you're going to get the blessing you were hoping for. Right now, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back with a loud voice. He glorified God and he came all the way back to Jesus, fell down at his face, on his face, at his feet, giving him thanks. And this guy was, of course, a Samaritan, right? Uh, this is one of the Jews' enemies. And Jesus answering said, were there not 10 cleansed? Where are the nine? Right? Where's the other nine? To come, didn't everyone come back to say thank you? Um, he said, none come back to return to glory to God, save this stranger. So he's a Samaritan. The others could have been Jews, some of them, right? I wonder if Jewish Samaritan, Jewish and Samaritan lepers hung out together. That's a question I do not know the answer to, right? If they were kind of like, hey, we're, you know, we're not going to be enemies anymore. We're both at the bottom of the, of the social system. He says, arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Now, here's something I just want to, I don't want to spend a long time on this, but I do want you to think about it. And that is, do you think all 10 felt grateful? I, I don't think there's a question that all 10 felt grateful. If you were to ask the other nine, are you grateful for Jesus? I doubt that any of them are going to go, well, not really. It wasn't a, that big a deal. No, they're all going to, they were just so excited that they got to return to society, right? That they, that they just went back to their families or, you know, and as I would, I'd be so excited to go see my, my family again that I would, uh, you know, I could see myself not remembering to go back and say thank you. So this is this story is not about feeling grateful. It's about expressing gratitude. Do you see the difference? There's, we all feel grateful, right? I don't think there's a person in this class who's like, nah, I got no one to be grateful for. Of course we do. We're grateful for our parents. We're grateful for our siblings and friends and mission companions, mission president. I mean, there's so many people who are like, I'm so grateful for them. This isn't about feeling grateful. This is about taking the time to return and express gratitude. Do you see the difference? Um, now, apparently, the difference between feeling grateful uh, can cleanse you 
Verse 19, expressing that gratitude can make you whole. Do you see that? They're all grateful. They're all cleansed. One expressed the gratitude and he was made whole. So here's what I want you to do. We have got to rise above just feeling grateful, you guys. We have got to express that gratitude. So um, pause the video. Uh, not yet. After I give you this assignment, I want you to um, pause the video uh, in a second and I want you to text three or four people a note of gratitude. Uh, and you don't have to, you know, you don't have to say something odd. You just say, um, you can just tell them what's happening. Um, so I'm in a New Testament class at BYU and the teacher uh, challenged us to, um, to text some people that we are very grateful for. And I thought of you. Uh, and then just say a couple of things like, I, I'm just so grateful that you are in my life or uh, I can't tell you, uh, you know, it's just about expressing gratitude. It's, you don't have to express it perfectly, right? Just say something like, uh, I, I, I don't think I've ever told you or I don't tell you enough um, that how grateful I am for you. All right. Um, and then, you know, grab that message and send it to somebody else. Now change it a little bit. Don't copy and paste the message, right? Make sure that you're specific in your gratitude. I'm grateful for not, I'm just grateful for you, but I'm grateful for, you know, this and this and this, whatever it is. Um, okay. I want you to try this. Uh, and then on the Q and A, tell me what um, responses you get. All right, maybe even screenshot it and email it to me, Hank underscore Smith at byu.edu. If you get a, if you get one that's really just oh wow you made my day or one that's like who is this, um, screenshot that and send it to me because I'd be fascinated to see what the responses are uh, to your gratitude. All right, pause the video. No, I'm serious. Pause the video. You're doing this. If you haven't paused the video yet, I'm so mad at you. I'm seriously so mad. But I'm gonna assume that you did. Okay. Um, let's keep going. Uh, Luke 18, 9 through 14 is another parable. Uh, it's a very simple parable where uh, the Savior says, um, there were two men at the temple praying. Uh, one was a Pharisee, the other was a publican. Do you see the extremes again? Right? So this is Luke 18, verse uh, 10. Two men went to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, Everybody loves Pharisees. They know everything about the scriptures, right? They're so great. They can teach me, right? They are, you know, they're my BYU religion professor. Everyone loves the Pharisees, right? Um, down to the publican. Everybody hates the publican, right? Matthew was a publican. He, he works for Rome. He's the enemy. He's the IRS. All right. So uh, you can see the two extremes. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee. There's some gratitude. I thank thee that I am not as other men are. Fascinating. There's some judgment there in his prayers. I am not an extortioner. I'm not unjust. That's dishonest. I'm not an adulterer. And I'm definitely not like this publican. How rude. Can you imagine saying that in your prayer? At least I'm not like him. Um, he says, I fast twice a week. And I give tithing of all that I possess. Okay, so we're going to take this guy at face value. We're going to say he's really this good. Okay, um, he does fast twice a week. Wow, he really keeps the oral law. That's part of the oral law. Remember, we talked about that. Uh, not the law of Moses, but part of the oral law. Um, he uh, he's not an adulterer. He is not dishonest. Uh, he is not an extortioner. I, I assume that's you know dishonesty again, extorting people. Um, and he pays a full tithing. You guys, this publican, or sorry, this Pharisee could pass a temper recommend interview, it sounds like. But the publican, standing afar off, didn't even get close to the temple, would not lift up his he eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast saying, please be merciful to me, I'm a sinner. Now, verse 14, I tell you, this man, the publican, went down to his house justified. Justified means um, kind of like looked at by God as a, that's good, right? That you're doing good. Um, rather than the other. Interesting. God is more impressed with the publican who is, we're going to take him at face value, a sinner than he is a Pharisee who could pass a temple recommend interview. Now, what, what is this about? Okay, so tell me, let's go back, look at the Pharisee's prayer and tell me, what is his prayer missing? What is his prayer missing? 
You probably saw it, humility and repentance, right? There is not an ounce of repentance in this prayer, or there's not a lot of humility in this prayer, right? Um, what is basically the entire prayer of the publican? Humility, God be merciful to me, a sinner, repentance. So it seems to me that the Savior, at least in this parable, and I could probably find it in others as well, sees a righteous person as someone who is repenting. Let me say it again. The Savior, I think, would say a righteous person is someone who is repenting. No matter where you are on the road, right, of life. If you're repenting, you're righteous. If you, let me know what you think about that. Am I going too far on that? Oh yeah, I did. Sorry, I just looked at my screen. I got a haircut. You probably, you probably thought that early on the, in this lecture, huh? You're like, hey, Brother Smith got a haircut. Actually, I got them all cut. Okay, I want to finish Luke before we go, so the second half can be on John. Uh, Luke 18, 18 through 25, I love this picture, um, is the rich man. This rich guy comes up to Jesus and uh, he says, Lord, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And uh, the Lord responds with, keep the commandments. And the guy says, I do. All these I have kept from my youth up. So we're going to, again, we're going to, he's honest. He keeps all the commandments. Good for him. Now, when Jesus heard these things, he said, you lack one thing. You guys, that's quite a compliment, actually. Sometimes people look at this and they're like, oh, how rude. No, if Jesus came to me and said, Brother Smith, you lack one thing, I'd be like, are you serious? Because <laughs> I would have guessed like I lack, uh, you know, a couple thousand things. So you're doing really well if the Savior says, if you said, Lord, search me, tell me what I need. And he's like, mm, one thing. You're like, wow. Okay. You lack one thing. Sell all that you have, distribute to the poor. So put everything on the classifieds, cars, everything, house. When you get paid for it, give all that money to the poor. Then come follow me. That's all you got to do. You guys, now here's a fascinating idea. How often does Jesus say, come follow me? Usually he says, people say, I want to follow you. And he's like, go back to your village, right? Go back to your, you know, do your thing. Um, but he's inviting him to be part of the inner circle. It sounds like, right? You could be part of, you know, you know, if not an apostle, uh, the next best thing, right? You can be part of this, of my group, my traveling gang, whatever, right? Um, that's a quite an invitation from Jesus. If Jesus made that invitation to you, I'm, you're, I know you're like, I would, uh, you know, it would be, be hard to sell all my stuff. No, it wouldn't. If Jesus asked you to sell your stuff, you'd be like, okay, right? And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful for he was very rich. Now, it never says he doesn't do it. It just says he's real, it's really difficult for him to do this. He's, oh, right. That's really sad. I guess because if you don't have a lot, then it's maybe it's easier to sell. I don't know. Maybe it's easier to walk away from, you know, uh, a 95 Honda than it is a 2020 Honda, right? That's what I drive. I drive a no, I drive a, two five, a 2005 Honda. Hey, right? Pretty nice, right? Okay. Um, now Jesus turns and he says, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier, this is Luke 18, 25, for it is easier for a camel to go through the, a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now that verse is interesting. It's gotten a lot of press over the years. Um, uh, how many of you have ever heard, I wish you were, I, I could see you. How many of you have ever heard that there is a gate of Jerusalem, right? Jerusalem is walled and there's a, they shut the gates at night, but there is one gate that's left open at night called the eye of the needle. And if, um, and if a camel wants to go in to, through the eye of the needle, he can't have anything, he can't be carrying anything. That's how skinny the eye of the needle is. So the camel can just squeeze through. Have you ever heard that story? Okay, get that out of your head because it's completely false. There is no such thing as the eye of the needle gate. Uh, it never existed. Now, some of you are like, wait, it's in Jesus the Christ, right? How could that not be true? Let's, when James Talmadge wrote Jesus the Christ, it was over 100 years ago, and it was based on his own, right, um, his own, influence from the spirit, but it was also based on the current scholarship of his day. So he had scholarly works with him as he wrote Jesus the Christ, and he consulted those. And it, a hundred years ago, 
that was considered mainstream scholarship, but eventually it was researched and found out to be totally bogus, it never existed. All right, so, um, so what does the savior mean then? Right, could you get a camel through the eye of a needle? Yes, you could, it, it's gonna hurt the camel. Um, and you'd have to have a significant press, right? Strainer, everything. You could get an entire camel through the eye of a needle. Uh, it would be possible. But yeah, the camel's not going to enjoy any of it. Um, the whole point is the next verse, because then his apostles say, who can be saved, right? Like if, if, if that's what you mean, if, it's, if, if I can't get through there. Oh, by the way, the word for um, camel is very close to the word for rope. So some English translations say it's easier to get a rope through the eye of a needle than to enter the kingdom of God. It makes no difference, right? Either one's, you know, supposed to be impossible. Now, verse 27 is the whole point, right? It is impossible for them who, oh, sorry, I was reading the JST. Uh, 27, he says, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Joseph Smith changed that too. And he said unto them, it is impossible for them who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God, but he who forsaketh the things which are of this world, and it is possible with God that he should enter in. The whole idea is that um, it is impossible for you and I to earn our way to the celestial kingdom. It's impossible. You cannot earn your way there. But things that are impossible for you and I are possible because of God or because of Jesus, right? You're going to the celestial kingdom, but it's not going to be because of you, my friends. It's going to be because of him. Uh, look at, uh, I'm going to go off the top of my head here. Second Ephi 2, 4, Second Ephi 2, 3, Lehi says to Jacob, I know that you are redeemed because of the righteousness of your redeemer. He doesn't say, I know that you're redeemed because of your righteousness. He says, I know that you are redeemed because of the righteousness of your redeemer. That's where our focus needs to be. All right. Um, did we get all the way through what I wanted to? Oh, there is one more story in uh, Luke that I want to look at. I don't know how I'm going to do, John. Um, you guys. <laughs> Uh, you're like, you're going to go over, I bet. You're going to go over your time. I know, I know. Don't be mad. Are you mad? Seriously, if you're mad, email me and be like, Brother Smith, it's not fair that you go over your time. Um, it's, it's really not fair. If we were in class, you wouldn't ever put up with it, right? You'd be like, Brother Smith, we have to leave. Uh, so I'm going to try. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, I hope you're speeding me up. Are you speeding me up so I don't take more of your time? Oh, man, you're going to kill me on my student reviews, huh? You're going to be like, he took too much time. Okay. Uh, Luke 19. Just one more story and we'll be done. This is the story of Zacchaeus. Some people call him Zacchaeus, but I, I, it, it sounds too much like cicada and the guy ends in, up in a tree. I just can't do it. So Zacchaeus is a publican. Again, you know how people are going to feel about him. Uh, and he's super short. Anybody have a Zacchaeus problem? Anybody super short? Uh, and so he, he wants to see who Jesus is. Now notice that. Um, he wants to see who he is. That's verse um, two, two, verse three. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was. They have never met before, right? He wants to see who he is. And so he climbs a tree, a sycamore tree, and Jesus comes under it, looks up and says, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today. I must abide at thy house. And Zacchaeus says, um, he comes down, says so Zacchaeus made haste and came down. I think he fell. Right, he falls out of the tree, and the Lord's like, "Oh, you okay?" Um, and uh, everyone says, "How can you eat with Zacchaeus?" Right? How can you go stay at the house of Zacchaeus? And Zacchaeus says, "He probably hears them talking about him." He says, "Lord, look at verse eight. I give half all my goods to the poor, and if someone accuses me of taking money from him, I give him four folds." So if you're like Zacchaeus, you ripped me off, and he's like, "How much do you think I ripped you off? Fifty bucks. Here's two hundred." Wow. Okay. We're going to, again, we're going to believe him here. Um, and Jesus says, this day is salvation come to this house for as much as he also is a son of Abraham, or he's an important person, right? Because that's how the Jews, remember, that's how they see their, that they're important is they're children of Abraham. And then verse 10, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Now, who's he talking to? You know, what's fascinating to me is when the Savior says stuff like that, 
I came to seek that which is lost. We all assume that other people are lost, right? I bet the people in the crowd are like, okay, you can go to Zacchaeus' house because he's totally lost. And I wonder if Zacchaeus is like, right? Came to seek those people that are lost, these people that are so confused about me. And the Savior never says, but it's, it's fascinating to me that we often think when the Lord says sinner or other, we're often thinking of other people, right? All right, you guys, uh, that was really long. Um, and I will, um, I've got to run down to Southern Nevada. I'm not going to run. I'm going to drive. And then uh, I will uh, be back tomorrow for our Q&A. Uh, so it's Wednesday today. Um, and then I'll be back for the Thursday Q&A. And then I will um, do the lecture tomorrow, the second half of the lecture tomorrow afternoon, the Gospel of John. All right. I love you to death. You're amazing. I will see you very soon.